Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Art Basel Conversations. It's wonderful to see so much of you here. Uh, this conversation is called How to Buy Art. And I welcome all the speakers, uh, Philippe Chapentinier, uh, Herman Stein, and Monique Berger. The conversation is moderated by Alexander Forbes, who is executive editor of Artsy New York, and he'll give you lots of details about who our speakers are and get right into it. And we're all very excited. Please join me in welcoming all the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, all for coming. Uh, just going to give a brief introduction to our, our amazing panel today. Uh, Philippe, uh, furthest from me, is the co-founder with Alex Moore of Moore Charpentier. Uh, the gallery was founded in Paris in 2010 and is presenting in Art Basel statements this uh, week. It was one of my personal highlights from the fair, uh, Lawrence Abu Hamdan's video installation, This Whole Time There Were No Landmines, uh, which incorporates found footage of the border between the Golan Heights and Syria, uh, which is known as the Shouting Valley. Lawrence's practice is emblematic of the gallery's program, which focuses on conceptual artists who examine the critical, social, and political debates of our time, and also includes artists such as Sedan Afif, Julieta Aranda, Teresa Margolis, and Carlos Mota. Next to him, <laughs> we have a fan. Uh, next to him, Herman Stein is the co-founder founder and CEO of the Prescient Group, which launched in 1998 and is an investment firm, and has since evolved to encompass several additional areas of private wealth management. In 2014, Herman founded the Sharon Art Collection with Dabing Chen as a way to contribute to the preservation and growth of the African art market. The collection offers an innovative model, which I'm sure Herman will be keen to tell us all about in a little bit, um, through which a number of collectors pool resources and are then able to take out a commensurate amount of work into their homes on a rotating basis. Artists in the collection include, among many others, uh, Toyin Odutola, Odubon Nakanga, Ita Baranda, and last year's Turner Prize winner, uh, Lubaina Hamid, who is exhibiting at Art Basel's feature section with Hollybush Gardens. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Monique Berger is the owner of the Berger Collection. Uh, based in Hong Kong, the collection spans over 1,200 artists, or artworks, I should say, by European, American, Indian, and Asian artists. Works from the collection are frequently placed on loan to major institutions worldwide, such as Paris's Centre Pompidou, the MCA Chicago, Tokyo's Mori Art Museum, and the London's Hayward Gallery. It has supported numerous ambitious projects, including Titus Kafar's Vesper Project and Julian Rosenfeld's Manifesto, which featured Kate Blanchett. Monique recently joined the board of Hong Kong's M Plus Museum and has actively supported institutions around the world, such as Hong Kong's Parasite and Asia Art Archive, the Kunsthalle of Zurich, and the Swiss Institute and Asia Society in New York. Uh, let's have a warm welcome to our panelists. So we're here ostensibly today to talk about how to buy art. Um, and I'm, I'll be curious in a second to give, uh, get a sense of in the room uh, how many uh, among you are, are currently collectors or, or buyers of, of art? Okay, fair few artists uh, out there. One, two, three, all right. <laughs> uh, and journalists or people otherwise involved in the art trade? Great. Um, so, but I thought it'd be interesting to start uh, before getting into the how with the why and hear from each one of you. Uh, you've, you all come from, uh, from very different backgrounds and hear why you, what first made you just decide to say, hey, maybe buying art is for me or uh, Philippe, I know you were, were not always an art dealer uh, and what made you decide uh, that, that selling art was a good idea? Maybe we'll start with you. Well, hi everyone, and please forgive my very strong French accent. I hope you, you will understand me. Um, no, I, we, are, we are dealers since seven years now, and just before I had also this experience as a young collector. But what we can say from the specific art market that we're talking not about a mass market, we're talking about a boutique market. And you don't go to a gallery, to an auction, as you can go to, to, to a shop, to your, to, to a luxury shop. So it's very important to know, the, to, to know the rules, to know how to interact with the key people, and to build, I think, mid-term or long-term long relationships. Because, because it's, a, it's a market where the trust, the reputation, the human relationships are really key. 
Herman, I'm particularly interested in hearing how you got so involved in the African art market in particular and supporting uh, young, young artists of the African diaspora. I think it's first it starts with the market that you're sort of more familiar with. So you start buying in the market that you know and un understand. And as you start buying, you realize how little you know, and you start researching. And once you've looked at the diversity and the different mediums that exist in the African market, you're just so drawn into it, you just ha you almost have to start buying. You can't, you can't stop. Um, and it, it, it's not that it's, uh, it's not a uniform market. Different parts of Africa are so different. So you get drawn in by how they create um, the art. And I think in, when you start looking at buying art, you're always looking for the artist who's done something for the first time. That did not, it's not a repetition of something else. And it seems to be very prevalent in Africa. People haven't necessarily all gone through a formal education. They've, a lot of it has been self-taught, self-motivated, and you see a lot of new creativity. And that just draws you in. It's a very exciting sort of space. Moni? I'm going to put on my glasses. But I was actually very happy when I walked in. I was not the only one with the paper in my hands. <laughs> um, when I was asked to join this conversation, how to buy art, I said, I have to rephrase that question. Because for me, I don't just buy art. I buy knowledge, awareness, joy, and daring. And I would like to start with a short story, because I actually have almost a story to every artwork that we bought. Did you know that Mahatma Gandhi wrote a letter to Hitler just a few weeks before the Second World War started? I had no clue until 2012, when Chitish Kalat, a Mumbai-based artist, told me about it. Gandhi begins the letter with the greeting, dear friend. Chitish describes this correspondence as a plea from a great advocate of peace to one of the most violent individuals who ever lived. The work covering letter is an immense installation and video projection. It is projected onto a traversable curtain of cascading fog. Kalat calls attention to the possibilities of peace and tolerance in a world plagued by violence, control, and surveillance. Max and I founded that project, and covering letter has been shown in different museums around the world. I guess that's a good kind of segue into your, your funding projects. Uh, all, uh, the, both of you are also purchasing many artworks. Uh, but kind of going back to the very beginning of that journey, uh, if you think about uh, yourself just getting started, uh, maybe on a, on a fairly limited budget, uh, or for those in the, out in the audience for that, who that might be true, uh, what's the kind of best single piece of advice or, or some rules uh, that you might suggest when, when first approaching that journey? It's a very difficult one to pose because we have arguments with our friends at home. Some people buy art because they like the picture and we try and say, well, there's more to the picture than just looking at it. There's understanding the artist, there's a bit of research. It makes your life fuller if you understand more. But not everybody has the time or the inclination to do that. Um, so the, the most precious advice you can give is tell people to go and visit museums. Go look at art, because if you, in, white, in your back of your mind, if you buy a piece and you ask yourself, can this one day be in a museum? It doesn't have to be expensive. <laughs> then somehow or another, you are able to judge whether that artwork is of value for yourself, if it looks good. And if you, if you think it might end up in a museum, that maybe helps you to make a decision. Can I say something to this? I think this is the most difficult question, actually, to answer. You know, when you walk through a fair and you see you know, so many artworks, how can you say this one might end up in a museum? I, I was told by Max Hollein, uh, when we decided against building a museum, he said, Monique, you know what? Good work will always end up in good museums, even if you don't have an own museum. Um, I think, for me, it's very important that, um, as I said, by knowledge, have fun doing it, and don't just follow trends, because you might end up with what you buy. And that's a good thing, you know, but uh, then better buy something you really like and uh, you have on your walls or in a storage that you go back and look at and it will bring back a story why you bought the art piece. 
Luke, oh. I'm curious, when you're, when you're just working with a, a new collector who walks into the gallery for the first time, maybe hasn't bought their first piece, what, how do you kind of guide them through that process? Well, you know, when the first collect, uh, collectors come, and we, abs we absolutely don't know him, you know, we have just to have this first conversation, to just to check what is, what is his taste, what is his personal history, what is also this, his relation with, I would say, uh, the society, the zeitgeist, or uh, the common history, and to check what kind of practice, medium, uh, history is, is looking for. But that was something also um, uh, Monique told about, the knowledge. It's very, we have a role, we have a modest role, but we have a role as a transmission, transmission of knowledge, a transmission of artist practice, of different uh, geographical scenes, so that we have just this small role in the chain, but I think essential, just to give this idea. And then when somebody comes, you know really fast uh, if this person will go into your program or not. We have fantastic relationship with collectors uh, who won't be client ever for the gallery or we would have to change the program, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we have to pursue this collaboration, this dialogue, and then we, we started with young or established collectors with one artist and at the end, a couple of years after, they were almost buying the entire program until 20 artists following the artists, purchasing small work to very key pieces from the artist. And from a dealer point of view, I think our most important role is to get access to some collectors to the best pieces of, for, from the artist. And this is about time. This is about uh, interaction, communication. And I, I said previously, I think the human factor is key in, uh, in this practice. If really you have this uh, uh, feeling that, that collectors are going to patron your artist, your program, to put your artist into museum acquisition committee, you will, you will go for these long-term partnerships. You know, Monique, you mentioned something earlier uh, that I thought was interesting about selecting a gallerist as much as selecting an artist. And I wonder if you'd share that uh, a bit with, with, with the audience here, because I think that uh, that's a, it's a factor that people don't think about necessarily as much. Uh, maybe when you're first getting started out, that that can be as, as, as important of a relationship as with the artist himself? In my experiences, when you start to buy art, it's normally through a gallery. Uh, art fair comes even later. I think my first entry into a gallery ended up buying an artwork. And uh, it was actually with Eva Priesenhuber, who was very young like me at that time, uh, and she made her career. And from there, I actually met another very young gallerist, Eva Bernheim, who started her own career, about, uh, her own gallery about two years ago. So I worked with her while she was still with Eva Prisenhuber, and I'm still not supporting, but working with both galleries. Uh, and Eva just decided to you know, start her own thing and, and um, you know, bring her own views and her own young artist to a collector. Circle. Uh, you know, we think galleries are crucial in the process. And, and if you look at the financial markets, which we're sort of more familiar with is historically, is that you have an investment managers and you have stockbrokers. And stockbrokers provide you with a lot of research. And you choose a great stockbroker, you'll probably end up with better performance. And then the galleries do a lot of research for you. They bring the information to you, and they're very accessible. It's, it's very difficult for a new collector or a new buyer to go access galleries because they feel intimidated. I started buying in auctions first. But you can sit in the back and nobody sees what you're doing. But, um, but then you eventually start getting to know galleries and then that's when you expand your knowledge. And they really are a research base for you. You brought up the, the financial aspect, and I guess at, at auction it's very easy to know what the price is because if you decide that that's what you want to bid, that's what the price is. Uh, but when you're looking on the primary market side, how do you know uh, when the price is right? Are there certain things that you look for in the artist's CV? Uh, are there aspects beyond that? Do you, is it really just about trust with the gallerist? Sure. Uh, there's probably two different types of art. Art that's been on auction and secondary markets, so you've got some indication. And you can look at it, it's not going to be perfect, but you can, you can look at it and get a guide. When you're buying artists that haven't really traded publicly on the open market, secondary market, it's very difficult. And you have to then look at how the gallery has managed the price 
of that artwork? Have they accelerated it too much? Are they pushing it? To, you know, and, and you have to get a feeling if the gallerists know what the market can bear for that artist. And maybe specifically from an African aspect, there's probably some of our African art that can sell for much higher in Europe than in Africa. But if you sell it at that price, you'll kill the local market, which is the dominant. So it's a, it's a very difficult place to pitch the price. And you have to, to a large extent, go with the gallerist and trust that they're going to look after the artist well. Philippe, I'm here, curious to hear from the gallerist side, especially when you're working with a, an artist whose prices haven't been that well established. How, how do you go about that process? Well, I think we must be careful because we have seen in the last five years a very young artist without any CV, just show in a gallery, uh, getting very crazy prices. And they were put into auction houses just six months after the production of the pieces, which is a disaster for the ecology of the market, for the artists, for everybody. And uh, I think that in this sense, uh, a young artist, even with a high trajectory, must have fair prices. And that's something we discuss with the artist, with the uh, gallery and colleagues uh, we're sharing the artist with. And I always talk to my very young artist, very ambitious, very, very, very hungry in a way, you know, to be patient. Because everything is about patience, uh, long-term career, and uh, placement into institutions into biennial, and that's very important. You can put the price higher, for example, if one of your artists having a major presentation at Documenta, at the Venice Biennial, or making uh, a solo show in a museum, but you can't say after, for example, a successful solo show in an art fair, that the price will increase. Because saying this, it abs would be absolutely stupid. So we have to be careful, but we have really to check, and that's a piece of advice I would give to uh, any new collectors, check the CV first and check the practice, check uh, the curators, talk to other people, talk, talk even in sometimes to the very faithful art advisor or fellow collectors. That's what you, you have to do first, specifically with a young or mid-career artist. Do you find that after those really astronomical and, and very quick price increases that we saw a few years ago, that younger artists are expecting their prices to rise more quickly than, than would be healthy? Is that, is that a key? This is something which happens. Yeah. This is something which happens, and we must not forget that there is a high discrepancy between some records and the reality of the secondary market. So if you're just checking the, uh, the press every day, you're thinking, wow, it's a fantastic bubble. But in fact, it's not that much. So we must be all cautious with this. And this is also the, the shared role between collectors, dealers, auction houses, curators. We must be conscious of this. Monique, in the time you've been in the market, I think that things have changed quite dramatically. And I'm curious if there, ha, has there been ways that you've renegotiated what you get involved with on a, on a price basis? Is it based on the project individually? Are there artists who now you, you try to support the project from the outset rather than, than buy afterwards? Let me tell a story again. Uh, about four years ago, I got an email from a very young Hong Kong artist who moved to Berlin, Isaac Chong. And um, he got my name from a professor at uh, Baptist University in Hong Kong. And he said, why don't you write her? So he sent me this letter that says, I was invited to the Moscow Biennale, and they want to show my work. And I don't have the money for the train ticket. So I called him, and uh, I talked to him about the project. And I was fascinated. And uh, we paid him for the trip. And I said, what I want in return is a one-pager of explaining the project and some photographs of your experience. That has changed because I get in touch with very young artists who are not in the gallery program yet. Uh, but Isaac now is actually in two shows. He just uh, had one work bought by M+. And I was very happy that I was there at the time where he just needed money for the train ticket. That's, that's a great story. Um, Herman, I, I'm actually curious, you know, your collection, you collect privately. Um, but you also have the Sharan collection, which, which is a kind of collective model, as I mentioned in the beginning. I'm curious if you can walk us through how that works exactly. Uh, I understand that everyone that's involved has to, to agree on 
the acquisitions that are made. I wonder if that's ever limiting, if there are things you know, that you said, oh, you look back on, you wish you could have gotten, but there was one holdout. Um, but really, you know, walk us through how that, that collective collecting model can work. I think one of the things that Philip said is talking to fellow collectors to determine if something is worth something and, and to understand it. And by having a collective and, and being on the same side um, is a great advantage. So you, you, you just got three minds and we've got a full-time collection manager, Brett. So you got four minds looking at a painting, looking at an idea, looking at the direction you, you want to go into. And it just makes us, I think, better collectors. Um, it gives us a bigger budget. <laughs> um, we've got more, more money to manage the collection with, but that takes a lot of effort. Um, we started the, the sort of collective when we spoke about how difficult it was to manage a collection, get everything right, the insurance, the documentation, make sure everything you get from the gallery is right. If you want to lend it out, there's a numerous amount of paperwork that has to be done, and we couldn't do it on our own. So you, you put that together, and, um, and it's more fun. So what we did is we said, well, we create a, a, a sort of a partnership model where everybody can contribute money and or art. And then we have um, sort of quarterly contributions to the partnership. And so we have a budget that we can spend in a year. And then we go out and try and find the art that fits our uh, mandate. And our mandate is African um, contemporary. And we do have to all agree. Um, the fortunate thing is that our budget is so small <laughs> that <laughs> there is no limit to what <laughs> it doesn't limit what we do. If you look at the prices of the artworks, um, just yeah, I mean, we, you can buy enough with, with, uh, with just by what you agree. And if we disagree, any one of us can buy it ourselves and hold it ourselves. And if, but if the collection wants it, that's got first priority on, on the artwork. And then, yes, because we together we can borrow the art to our houses, to our offices. We use it. Um, it's, it's a living collection. I think it's an interesting model if you look at kind of broader consumption trends and uh, particularly younger generations being less inclined to, to own material goods outright, uh, the growth of the sharing economy, et cetera. And I, I wonder um, whether from Philippe, uh, Monique from the uh, collecting side or, or Philippe, if this is something that you think about at all, if there are new models that you would consider for uh, for new generations to get involved who might have different priorities. They might not want to kind of own things in the way that, that current generations have. I have another story. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm actually very grateful in what I'm doing. And it's important to me to share my passion with friends and family. So I started to organize Toy Meets Art Dinners around the world. And in 2016, we just did a special project with Netko Solakov, who's actually here in the audience. Hi, Netko. He's a very well-known artist from Bulgaria, a storyteller par excellence. He made a series of 123 drawings called The Optimistic Stories. I have known Netko for many years, and uh, we have collecting his work with joy. But for this particular series, I had another idea. I wanted to take it apart. So he was not very pleased when I told him. But after hearing my story, he said, that's actually a very good idea. So all of our friends, number one and 123, are in our collection. But the other 121 are actually around the world with all of our friends. And together, we will always be the optimistic stories. I'm also looking, interested in kind of looking kind of towards the future, I guess, at how important digital tools and the internet have become um, on, the, on the business side, on the sales side, and also as, as collectors on the research side. Uh, do you ever transact online? Uh, is, it, is it a research tool? How, how important, I guess, and starting with Philippe from the, from the sales side. Well, I think uh, digitalization is something absolutely key now. And not only for showing your artist on your website, on Artsy, on, on Instagram, but I can say that since a couple of months, we regularly made some sales from artworks we put on our, on our Instagram, including doing the art first, you know, people absolutely, I, I had I even had these very nice things during the Armory Show New York presenting uh, huge artwork. Somebody from Marseille, 
really, that we never went to the Armory Show. I think we even never went to New York, told us, well, this is a great work just the day after the opening, and we saw like this, you know? So it's also important, and, uh, but I must say, you have to be in interaction with the works at some point. Uh, it's very important. But uh, one the big trend, and you can see that all over the fur and the other art fur, is that our, the iPad has been now key for the sales and uh, and specifically for us dealers, we are able to sell other work from the artist on iPad or to just to make a first introduction. And this is, this is very important. Then I think the, when you check uh, the online sales for the galleries are not really key in the annual turnover at this moment. But we can imagine that there is a new generation of collectors coming. When you talk with your older colleagues, uh, what were the collectors specifically in Europe? There were people from a certain, uh, certain uh, high social level, but doctors, psychiatrists, uh, uh, lawyers, they, were, they had a lot of time to spend with the galleries. They went directly to the gallery. They were able to make five to 10 outfits a year. And the new generation is absolutely hardworking, super busy. They have no time. They're coming in an offer for just five hours. So you have to feed them with uh, your social networks, with your website, with your newsletter including with WhatsApp. You have to be in touch always with them. And that's a new way of, of course, of feeding collectors and just pursuing, pursuing this dialogue. I think we always want to see art piece before we buy it. I mean, there might be some well-known artists that um, we might, might look at a, a picture and say, okay, we, we know the series and we'll buy it, but we like to see it. But where technology does come in is that I can communicate with the other three instantly as we walk around and I'm looking at it and we can sort of make decisions. I think what's interesting is that in South Africa they've launched, um, two auction houses have launched online auctions and there's been a massive take up in that in terms of the volume of artwork and I don't know the exact numbers but I think about three years ago the artworks were selling between two and five thousand rand, they're now selling 50, 60,000 rand pieces on the, on, the, on the, so it's definitely moving, there's definitely a market in that. It's not the market that I'm very active in, but it, it is, there's definitely a space for it, and people are moving in that. And the value of the arts definitely that's sold on the, um, the electronic auctions, the online auctions, are, are increasing. Um, uh, the only thing I bought ever by image is from works that we have, or from artists that we already had in the collection. That, for example, I couldn't travel to New York or whatever, but I knew already um, what this artist you know, did before that. Otherwise, uh, we venture into new media all the time. And uh, some of you might know, we open our next exhibition with part of the collection in Düsseldorf. John Yetzer, who is the curator of Unlimited here as well, will curate our show. It's how to see what isn't there. He, and Johnny explores for our show the dichotomy between presence and absence. And for this, we invited John Rothman to do a virtual reality project. So I'm daring. I have no clue what he will do. Uh, but the place where we have this exhibition used to be a Raketenstation Homburg. As its name reveals, it's military and exists within a history once dominated by the Cold War. And so John will actually use that site and bring it into the museum. It offers a new interpretation of the surroundings through virtual reality. And just a quick thing about digitalization, specifically in China and in Hong Kong, where Monique lives, uh, a lot of Asian galleries are using WeChat now, and some of our young uh, Asian collectors are really fond of WeChat, and we see all the preview of Abba the Hong Kong or other fellow Asian art friends on WeChat. So I don't know if you, Monique, are using this kind of tool right now. I, I use WeChat, but still more WhatsApp. But uh, when I'm in China, it's really WeChat. But I haven't bought art through WeChat. We, yeah, we, we, use an, we have an Instagram account. Just, I mean, I had my own. I have my own for many years, but we had one now for the burger collection. But mostly to, you know, upload images from the upcoming show. And the prolifer proliferation of WeChat has been Unbelievable. I think $9 trillion worth of transactions happened on that platform last year. It's just 
pretty pretty hard to comprehend, and, and we'll only see the art world moving there more. Um, I guess going, you know, towards once you've purchased, or maybe even as you're purchasing, um, I, I'm curious how what you see your kind of primary responsibility as collectors. You know, I think it's it's no uh, secret that. Uh, small and mid-sized galleries are having a hard time of it. I'm wondering if that ever comes into your mind. And, and Philippe, I want to hear what you think collectors could do more to, to support those galleries. Um, but I, I wonder if, it's, if there is this responsibility ever to the ecosystem as a whole, if it's really a responsibility to the artist, if it's to uh, the individual artworks and preserving the collection, um, how, how you guys kind of negotiate that responsibility level. I think everybody starts as buying art and when do you become a collector you know it's not a title you just get my husband and i we started to buy art about 22 years ago and in 2005 i uh, went to the storage and said what have we done and i said you know we have to look at this really seriously because um, this is not the way to go forward and i traveled around europe and visited other people that started buying art or called themselves already collectors, and most of them built museums. And I came home and I said, I don't think this is the way I want to go. Not because of I don't have the responsibility, but I don't, don't want to run the museum. I'm a true collector. I love to travel. I love stories, as you can hear. Uh, and I had to find another way to actually show art. This is, we are very generous lenders. We work with a lot of museums. We started doing our own shows. We had one in Berlin. Uh, we had a big show in Hong Kong in an old slaughterhouse. And now we do this big project in uh, Dusseldorf. I have a team that works with me. It's uh, storage, it's logistics, it's uh, documentation. We do publications. It's a real job. And I take it seriously even though I don't have a museum. I think for a short while, I had a gallery with Elano sitting here in the audience and saw how expensive it was to look after artists and the amount of effort that the gallerist puts in to make sure the artist produces work on time, doesn't spend all their money, arrives in the places, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult job. So it, you, you need to, I think, People who buy or collect art have got the responsibility to not bypass the gallery. That's number one. I'm not trying to be clever and go to the artist directly. The gallery has a function to perform and, and, and needs, to, needs to perform that function and we need to support them. Which galleries you choose is a difficult one. Um, I think the gallery that discovers the artist should get the support, but that's you can't always do that. They don't necessarily have the reach to take them to other places. Um, so it's a difficult decision on how you transition between galleries. Um, and then I, I think that's the best way you can support artists um, because, because they will supply the residencies. As a, a collective, we do supply residencies. <clears throat> and we we're quite pleased that some of our artists have now even appeared um, in, in European galleries. But <clears throat> not our artists, the artists that we help with the residencies. Um, so you can help there, but still somebody else must take them further. And again, I think galleries play a role. And then I think lending art is, is a big thing. We, we're very committed to that. We'll lend art to any reputable institution that we think will look after it well, to display it and show it. Um, and then being part of the conversation. There are a lot of state institutions that don't have money or budgets to buy and need support and, and need to be looked after. So you've got a responsibility to bring them up into th this competitive world. And Philippe, I know from your side, I'm sure all of your clients are perfect, so I won't ask you to tell stories about them. But if you had to say... Them. A huge majority of them. <laughs> um, but if you had to point to any tendencies uh, that, uh, that collectors or buyers, I know this is a differentiation that maybe we'll, we'll dig into a little bit as well. Um, you know, whether it can be lengthy payment periods or... Uh, hard negotiating or sometimes not paying for works at all. Uh, are, how big of a factor are those for galleries that are just starting out uh, when you're trying to negotiate how to, how to get your artists paid and, and pay the bills for the gallery, et cetera? 
Well, I just would like to say that what was said by both Herman and Monique was absolutely true, that uh, we were talking about more than collecting about social responsibility and what you're doing for the African scene of what Monique is doing with the patronage, with showcasing the artists you purchase into institution, into your own space is absolutely fantastic. It's key for giving the best promotion to these artists. And uh, we were just talking very briefly about this distinction between what are collectors versus buyers. And we must say that collectors, it's not only purchasing art and all what was said, uh, storage, insurance, uh, relationship with uh, absolutely with curators, as you do for your upcoming show in, in Dusseldorf. So this is a global ecology of the art market. Buyer, of course, you can make very nice one-shot sales, but you don't really create the future. You don't build. You don't build really a lot of things unless you have a very high volume of sales made with buyers. And uh, well, we were not born as a gallery when the crisis happened. But all our very nice and good colleagues told us that 2008, 2009, when everything was collapsing. They just finally got with the collectors and not the buyers. The buyers all vanished, and this gallery was at this time in very high difficulties. So this is uh, this is very important to make this distinction. And regarding collectors with uh, with payments with everything, when you have a very good relation with your collectors, it's absolutely. It's a mutual agreement. It's absolutely key to give also a discount, to encourage them to discover more artists, to be kind with them, to send them all the documentation, to make them discover something else. I'm, we are this particularity to be based in Paris, but also in Bogota, uh, where the market are new, and our, where this uh, collecting dimension is totally new. And don't take that wrong, but not that good educated because it's something new, you know, in, in this market we're dealing with. Colombia is a good example. And the, the art fair in Colombia, Bogota, just after um, a week after FIAC, has been a very good platform for this. And they were struggling since the last edition with the quality of dealers from Europe, from the United States. And I told to some of the local buyers, not collectors, uh, well, you didn't really support your fur. You didn't really support these people coming because these people also were bringing new artists from other market, but also artists from the local market because you were so long for paying them. So, you know, the best thing you can do with an artist, there is so many ways to support an artist from uh, supporting promotion uh, of production, promotion, even kindness. Uh, but the most important thing, you have to sell your artist. So otherwise that won't work. So. In this way, some people have a particular responsibility to help the gallery to be paid and then to make the ecology of the system work and succeed. So that's absolutely key. But I was, I just come back from Buenos Aires when maybe, as you know, a huge devaluation is happening. Uh, people are just losing 30, 35% from, from facing the dollar. And uh, the local collector really decided, and they are not that much, but they are maybe 20 to 25 to support the local galleries, to say, well, we have to help them to survive. Otherwise, it will be a common disaster for the artist, for the art scene, for the reputation of Buenos Aires. So once again, it's linked to the social responsibility you were also uh, describing in your both cases. Before we go to questions from the audience, which I think we have uh, maybe time for one or two more questions beforehand, um, I wanted to ask you guys about mistakes or if, whether they're kind of impulse buys or things where you look back. Uh, I liked what you said before, that you have to look, you know, live with all the things that you bought. Uh, one of those kind of core things that people will typically say about what makes a good collector is oftentimes not selling work. But are there instances where you've said, this is really doesn't belong in the collection, it needs to get sold off. Do you, do you maintain those works over time, which I understand can be uh, costly, or have you been uh, perfect in everything that you've ever purchased? I think we all have this closet, and nobody talks about it. Uh, but that's also the journey of collecting, and I think you evolve. It's not a mistake, but you might not buy this same thing today. Uh, but I wouldn't be where I'm now with without having done what I've done 20 years ago. Um, what 
we did also, we supported a lot of charities. And I think we have to find a new way because we go to these events and we buy artworks that most of the time are not the best ones and overpriced until we finally get it. And uh, what do you do with these works? You know, like uh, they're probably not on the website. They're not really part of the uh, collection. We like them, but we would not have bought them no, for the collection. So yes, we have this corner of artworks that we actually right now think about a way of dealing with it. And a way of giving it back is doing another charity or giving them back to a charity to raise funds again. Yeah, that is that's one clever way. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I, I think so, so, I haven't looked back and thought about mistakes, but just how your tastes have changed. I mean, we started buying, you buy landscapes. I mean, that's something that degrades your wall and you like it. Uh, ten years later, that's not what you want to have anymore. Okay? So, so, so it wasn't a mistake at the time. And yesterday we went for a wine tasting. And the, 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 the sommelier asked, what do you smell? And somebody says, strawberries. And he says, if you smell strawberries, then you're right. <laughs> it's what you smell. So what you buy at the time isn't wrong. It's just you bought it, you've got it. And it is an issue what you do with it afterwards. Um, and you do have a sort of a stack that builds up. But it's m mostly because your taste changes and you develop likes for new things. And then you've got to deal with uh, the older art. In the collection, it's easier because we've got a more formal process than and what we had in our private. And, and, and there will be a, a systematic like, change in, 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 in objective that will result in us maybe selling something and then reinvesting it into other art. Can I just say one more thing? If you start um, with an artist 20 years ago and um, you keep buying his work because you really want to collect him in death, that uh, means that perhaps you have one or two works in the collection that you might, might not have bought as a first work. But it makes sense to have an overall view of the artist's work. I think we'll open the floor to questions for a few minutes, and we, I have many, many more for the panel, but want to give a chance for everybody to answer the question, or ask the questions that they have in the audience. So a show of hands, and someone will come over to you with a microphone. There's a question over here. What are red flags for you um, when you buy into a new artist? What, what wouldn't you buy? The first thing we'll, you have to do some research and as Philippe said, you have to like think about the artist and if, if the artist is copying something that already exists, I think that, that's what we won't buy. And we will say, well, no, that's, it's, he's not copying it to plagiarize, he's just not got an original um, creative thing that he's putting on a piece of paper or she's putting on. So that, that's what I'll avoid. I'll, I'll have to see if it's, if it's unique, is it new, is it really something that that artist created themselves. If I, can't, if I can't find that, then I'll, I'll leave it. I think for me, if it doesn't fit into what I'm collecting, knowledge, awareness, joy, and daring, um, I really don't have an example for that. You know, like, I think I never had red flags. It's just like something I really don't like, or it doesn't trigger something in me. Hi, um, I wanted to get your view on what the, say, top three biggest hurdles for collectors are, um, or problems, because I'm working on a project connecting collectors and artists. I wanted to get your view on what you think, uh, from the perspective of a dealer or a collector, what the biggest issues are, which you have resolved or are left unresolved, just to get a view, thanks. Sure, it's having structure is the biggest hurdle. Is you, 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 there's so much that one likes that you can buy in a shotgun approach and at the end of the day, what have you really put together? So if you're building a collection, there must be some reason to build that collection. So you, you, you need to find the structure and that's very difficult. You walk around the art fair and you see things that, and you might end up buying it and you get home and say, well, that doesn't fit into the direction that we were going into. So it, it, that is the biggest and most difficult thing to do is define your collection and define what the structure is do you maybe have some cornerstones, which you, you put down pillars and then you collect around that, or you're creating themes, but you must, you must 
get that right. Once you've got that right, your decision making becomes a bit easier. We are so different. I don't have a direction. I'm totally led by intuition. Uh, but it really depends. If it's your own collection, follow your instinct. Don't just follow trends. You know, pick words like I, I use my four. And if they fit them, look around, you know, and, and be diverse. But that's why private collections are interesting because they're also very different. Find your own language and then collect what fits that language. I think I'll offer something as well. For new buyers, uh, one of the things that, and I'm curious to get your guys' thoughts on, on but even the, some of the language of the art world, the exclusivity of it, uh, the, the way that it's been formulated sometimes can be difficult for people to even just feel comfortable walking in the door the first time. Um, so I'm curious what we can do to help uh, newer people that, that might find the art world intimidating uh, get comfortable buying, because there's certainly a lot more people with uh, the capacity financially to buy art than, than are buying art today. Well, at first sight, that could be intimidating for a lot of people, specifically with the gallery world and with the art first. And in this way, the art first has been a fantastic platform to discover very different program and not to get this first uh, complicated approach. And I would say that a couple of de two, three decades ago, that was absolutely something very small. I think in Paris, we were talking about less than 100 collectors. So that was a very small cycle. And if you check at the galleries based in Paris, we were talking for just contemporary art about 20 to 25 dealers. But we had all, I think, experienced this big shift. And I would say that through the social networks, through all the information you can get, coming to the gallery, coming to the fur is absolutely less intimidating. But uh, I just have a piece of advice. Uh, just be ambitious and don't be shy. Come. I think a huge majority of dealers are really welcoming new people coming. It's also very important because uh, coming from a French point of view, where France is also a conservative country, uh, you don't have that new generation coming and this is something we have to encourage, new people coming and the collectors, and I think that was you both experience. You just purchased first a couple of years ago, a long time ago, first work, second work. Uh, I even remember when I just purchased my first work. Now it seemed to be a disaster, but I was 16 years old, and this, but I'm not ashamed of this. It's, uh, collecting is a result of a personal history, and that you can have very device, thing, uh, device dimension of collecting. Uh, Monique is explaining that it's something linked to intuition. A man is just structuring something very different, but at the end, at the and after all these years of collecting, you will see that at the end, you had even a secret structure. You, just quickly, you remember perhaps that I told you the story about the 123 uh, drawings that I, uh, that we gave away to a circle of friends. They were actually all very young people in their mid-twenties, and most of them are not collectors yet. But I think with this initiative, I opened that door that they kind of are part of a bigger work, and they got to know Netco, we made a movie out of this, and it was almost like a little initiative to get them into being interested and being bold and uh, willing to go to galleries and art shows or uh, graduation shows, I think is also like a very nice way of you know, seeing really, really you know, new works. Question there? Uh, yes, you've been giving wonderful advice and you had expressed uh, sort of a, a litmus test uh, with this piece of art being a museum and you had mentioned a final piece of advice, don't forget to ask for the CV for a new artist. Are there similar litmus tests or questions we should ask to a new gallery or someone new who's representing an artist that we meet? We always got drawn to a gallery because of the artist that they had. And then we got to know the gallery. Not, we never went to meet the gallerists first and then, and then see what art they have. So I, I don't think I've ever done it that way around. So I, I think when they have the artists, they automatically have some, some history because they've got art. And then it's not so difficult to, 
to, to look at the, the gallerist. And at the end of the day, there are honest people and dishonest people. <laughs> and that you only find out by over time. Yeah, so I, 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 don't, I haven't ever looked for a gallerist. I've looked for art and then found the gallerists. Yeah, I think this is very true. It's uh, very much about people. So if you enter a gallery that you have never been into, meet the gallerist. Talk to him about you know, his journey, how he became a gallerist, and see how that feels. Uh, because I think with all the galleries I've been working with, I still have a very good relationship, and they became like families. The same thing with artists. So it's really a personal approach. Um, I ma manage a art law firm between Paris and London, and um, I get quite a lot of collectors coming to me, so high net worth individuals or just um, upper middle class people who've decided to invest in Chinese art or stuff like that. And usually they have issues with um, the work of art which arrives um, after the transportation or organized by the gallery which is shattered in pieces and uh, the gallery says, what, what, what insurance? I mean, how come you didn't take any interest? Stuff like that or uh, the um, report um, from the, um, the, art, the auction house was not um, uh, representative of the state of the, of the um, uh, artwork and therefore the, uh, my, my client doesn't want to pay because he's, he doesn't, he's been a victim of misrepresentation, etc., etc. So right now, during this whole conversation we had, um, you looked very much into the curating aspect and uh, the creative part of it. So how do you select art artists? How do you select galleries? But, I mean, it seems that um, uh, galleries do not want to enter into contract. They just give invoices to um, buyers hardly ever any terms and conditions, which baffles me, totally baffles me. And um, also auction houses seem to be, you know, on, on the fringes of very, uh, having a very borderline also uh, um, process in terms of taking up responsibility. So therefore it very often ends up in court because we try to do mediation, but forget it, they, they won't mediate. So how, how do you protect yourself against that? How, what, what are your, uh, what is your sort of streamlined rigorous process to make sure that you will have proper warranty certificate of, um, of um, that that this is the, the, you know the, the proper artwork and that it, you have guaranteed provenance, and also um, that um, during transportation if something happens to the artwork, you will get a refund or a replacement. How do you protect yourself against all that? Thanks. Now that's why we've got a collective. <laughs> we need money to do that. We need a few people to contribute. I think we sign, there are one or two exceptions. We've signed a contract with every single gallery we bought from. Um, what we can do with the art after we bought it, can we use it for this? Because the copyright always remains that of the artist. Now can we put it in a brochure or aren't we? Um, transport, we make sure we're insured. Um, there's always issues with that. And we have so far not had any damage that we had to really go and do. What we have done is transport people putting the wrong price on the tag and then the import duty is wrong. And then who pays the, who pays the penalty for that? Um, so fortunately we have, we've had good agreements with, with gallerists. I haven't, I haven't had a problem with them refusing to do that because it's not a very onerous agreement. But it's just a very clear agreement that this is what we can do with art. This is what and, and how it gets to us, and the expectation that we have with the galleries the other way. <clears throat> if we ever would like to sell the art, we will go back to the gallery, <laughs> and we'll talk to the gallery. So there, there's a, a two-way street. If you if you're dealing with the gallery in that way, they will deal back with you in the right way. Well, a huge majority of for, for colleagues of the gallery are absolutely very professional, giving invoices, signing contracts, uh, taking insurance, uh, absolutely coordinating all the shipping issues. So I know that everybody in his life just had a bad experience, and uh, we have absolutely to condemn all bad practice. And we have also to condemn all back practice coming also from the collecting dimension because it also happened to have people just uh, canceling your work six months after having taken it. But 
what we do in Paris in the French committee is that we have specific rules and once a year or once or two years we have to exclude a member who were not able to fulfill Susie's rules. But this is something I would say very rare. We just are facing very honest people in both sides, collectors and galleries. I think that's all we have time for, but thank you three so much for your time and thank you all for coming to uh, this evening.